Hi, and welcome to module 10 of Video Lecture 2, the last module in Video Lecture 2. This one is on limits of functions and the concept of continuity of functions. Um, this is the last, as I said, the last module of Video Lecture 2. At, after this point, we're ready to tackle um, part two of the course on um, calculus in one dimension. Okay, now we discussed limits before, a couple modules ago, limits of sequences and series, limits of functions aren't really any different. They're written the same way, in fact. The major difference is now, instead of saying that the index of a sequence or series goes to infinity, we let the argument of the function x go to whatever you want it to be some c, some constant c. This can be infinity, it can be zero, it can be seven, it can be whatever you want it to be. Sometimes the limit of function is really, really simple. So for instance, the limit of the function x squared as x goes to three can be found simply by plugging in three into x squared to get three squared or nine. In general, if you want to find the limit of a function, the first thing you can try is simply to plug in the number into the function. That works for infinity too. The limit of 1 over x as x goes to infinity, plug in infinity to the bottom here, 1 over infinity is 0 in the limit. So that's 0. We've been kind of loose with the whole plugging in infinity thing, but um, hopefully you get used to that in this course next series, um, but in general, as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger, 1 over x gets smaller and smaller until it goes to 0 in the limit. So that's the limit of a function. Um, however, we can also do this more complicated functions. So for instance, um, let's see, limit of x squared minus x plus 1 as x goes to 7. We can plug in x7 the whole time. That's 49 minus 7 plus 1 equals 43. Again, we can just plug in the number if, we can, if we're allowed to do that. There are some cases, though, we can't do that. One sort of clear case would be the opposite of our earlier example. Limit of 1 over x as x goes to 0. This limit is going to be infinite. So if we act kind of loose with the term infinity, the limit of 1 over x as x goes to 0 is infinite. Um, that's the same thing that we get uh, if we had the limit of 1 over x minus 2 as x goes to 2. You plug in 2 to the bottom of that, and you get 1 over 2 minus 2, 1 over 0, which is infinity in the limit. So this is one way of, that's not quite as simple, but still, if you allow infinity to be a limit, you can get the answer simply by plugging in. However, there's some other cases that, are, that um, engender a little more complexity. So, what if you have a function that looks like this? Uh, so over here, it looks like that. And over here, it looks like this. So you can write this as a piecewise function. We discussed these earlier. It's equal to x as long as x is in 0 to 2, 0, and it's equal to 4 if x is greater than 2. There's a constant function if x is greater than 2, and equal to an identity function if x is between 0 and 2. So, what's the limit of this? Well, to understand this, we have to define limits from the left and from the right. So let's take a limit as x goes to 2. We'll put a negative sign there to mean from the left. That means we come up this way and go towards 2. We get closer and closer and closer to 2. The limit of this equals 2. Right? As we go closer and closer to 2, following from the left, we go up towards the point 2, and over here, that's 2, and this is 2. What about from the right, though? We can use a plus to indicate from the right going this way. And this limit, 
Well, the function's constant, so then it's pretty easy to calculate it. It's just 4. These things don't equal. So, we, so it has a left limit from the left and a limit from the right, but just a not equal. This function here has no limit. Could we give it a limit? Well, if we subtracted 2 from that 4 and instead had x and 2, like this, then we drop down this line to here, and the function would be continuous because it would be the limit would be 2 instead of 4, and then would have um, so this should be f of x, and then we have two instead of four, and the limit and the function would be continuous because the limit from the left and the right would be the same. So what we see is we can we can calculate a limit at every point. If a limit exists at every point, meaning the limit from the left and from the right are the same at every point, um, well are the same as each other at every point, then the function um, has a limit at every point. So, this is the limit of a function. There's some nice properties of these limits. The limit of the function as x goes to c of f of x plus g of x equals the limit of f. I'm dropping the x here because I want to write it over and over again. I'll drop the x goes to c as well. Similarly, if you take the limit of the difference, you get the, the limit, the difference of the limits. And even better, and I'm sorry if my writing is collapsing here, if you take the limit of the product, that equals the product, sorry, the product of the limits, which is very convenient, and even the quotient limit of the quotient equals the quotient of the limits. In this case, as long as limit g exists as n is not 0. Right. So there's some nice properties here. In terms of calculating these, um, well, so sometimes you can, so it's easier to calculate that sense. For some more complicated stuff, you can simplify. So if you have the limit, say as x goes to 1 of, um, let's say, x squared minus 1 over x minus 1, that's sort of tricky because um, you plug in 1, you get 0 over 0. But you can simplify by factoring. The top is x plus 1 over x minus 1. The bottom is, sorry, the speed limit is x goes to 1. Having a racer would be helpful. <laughs> um, these cancel. That's the limit as x goes to 1 of x plus 1, which equals 2. Because now I can just plug in x, and that's done. So by factoring, you can, you can do these things as well. Or sometimes if you have limit as x goes to infinity and you got some polynomials in here, um, let's see, you got make it really general here. You got ax to the k plus um, blah 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 blah, and you got b divided by b x to the let's see m. Well. If k equals m, then as x goes to infinity, the term with the highest power gets bigger and bigger and bigger relative to the term with the second highest power. So in the limit, all the terms that are not the highest power are relevant. And then you get the limit equaling a over b, because you can cancel the x k with the xm, and all the other terms are relevant. So this becomes a limit. If you have x less than k, sorry, k less than m, then the biggest term, the biggest power on the bottom, is bigger than the biggest power on the top. 
you get something that looks like this. You get A over B. If you look only at the biggest powers, something looks like this. What was X goes to infinity? Since M minus K is bigger than zero, this thing goes to zero. So if K is less than M, you get zero in the limit. And if K is greater than M, you get the same kind of deal. You get A X to the K minus M over B. Since K minus M is positive now, this is a positive power of X. As X goes to infinity, that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So this goes to infinity. So you can simplify as well if X goes to infinity by choosing the biggest powers on top and bottom and do more complicated versions like that. In general, you can use factoring and simplification and choosing the biggest um, values if X goes to infinity to try to simplify your problem and then plug in after the fact. There are more complicated ones. If you're stuck with something that looks like that ends up like zero over zero or infinity over infinity, and you can't get around it by factoring, um, you can use what's called L'Hopital's rule, which says that the limit um, of f over g equals the limit of f prime over g prime or f prime and g prime are derivatives, first derivatives. This is an incredibly useful rule, um, which makes the previous rule I just mentioned make a little more sense, potentially. Um, but to do this, you need calculus to take a derivative. Okay. Um, so that's some of the properties limits have. Why do we care so much about limits of functions? Well, um, we care primarily for two reasons. One is because it helps us understand whether or not a function is continuous. Before we get to continuity, it, we do the second reason, which is that it helps us calculate the instantaneous rate of change of a function, which is the fundamental thing you need to calculate when understanding a derivative. So when calculating a derivative, and you need to understand what a limit is to understand what a derivative is. We'll do this in much more depth starting in the next video lectures um, when we start part two of the course. But first, um, we need to understand continuity. Continuity is important because it helps us understand when you have a minimum or maximum of a function. And taking minimum or maximum of functions is essential um, to understanding, uh, well, to doing most of political science, whether you're trying to figure out the least squares in, a, in an OLS type of thing, we'll talk more about that later, or you're trying to calculate um, the maximum of a function, the ma utility maximum to do game theory. We spend a lot of time looking at minimum and maximum of functions, and to do that, we have to understand whether or not the functions themselves are continuous. So what is continuous? Well, a continuous function, simply put, is one that you can draw without picking up your pen from the paper. Or in this case, um, your stylus from your uh, pad here. So if I can draw it like this, it's continuous. If I have to stop and then draw it like this, it's not continuous. In this case, I don't have to pick up my pen. In this case, I do have to pick up my pen. Continuous, not continuous. The simplest way of describing it, we can get slightly more fancy by using limits. If the limit of the function as x goes to c equals the function evaluated at c, then the function is continuous at the point c. If this is true for all points c in the domain of the function, then the function is continuous on the entire domain. Let's see how that works in the examples. Um, here's a function, continuous function. I can choose any point C down here. Well, at that point, the limit exists. It's the same coming from the left and coming from the right. That's a different color. Coming from the left and coming from the right, the limit's the same. It's this right here. So the limit exists. At each point, I can pick C. It exists at every single point, and therefore, the limit exists at every point and the function is continuous. In contrast, for the function we dealt with earlier, the limit doesn't exist. The limit over here, coming from the left, is, there's two. 
limit over here coming from the right was four, we said. So the limit as x goes to two of f of x does not equal the evaluation at two. Um, in fact, the limit doesn't exist, at, doesn't exist at all. So this is not a function with, this is not a continuous function. It's continuous, mind you, everywhere except at x equals two. But because it's not continuous at x equals two, we can't actually, um, we can't actually um, find the limit there, and it's not continuous at that point. Why do we care? Well, um, we care because the lack of continuous function affects our ability to find maxima. We'll talk about this much more when we do maxima, but for example, let's say I have um, 0 to 1 over here. My function looks like this. That, that, open, that open ball means the function is defined such that it goes up, 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 up into this point, but it doesn't include that point. We can ask, what's the maximum of this function? Well, let's see, the highest point of the function is up here, but because it never actually hits this point, I can always go a little higher, a little closer to this point down here, say this is C. As I go closer and closer to C, my function gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but at C, it drops down to here. Therefore, for the exact same reason that we couldn't find the maximum sometimes on an open set, we can find the maximum on some discontinuous functions. Discontinuous, by the way, is how we say not continuous. It's either continuous or discontinuous. This function is discontinuous, and in this case, we can't find the maximum on this domain. Now, some functions can be discontinuous and have maxima. For instance, the other one we drew has a maximum, and well, has many maxima. Anywhere on this line is a maximum. So this is not to say that any discontinuous function has no maximum. Um, by the same token, some open sets have maxima on them. However, you're not guaranteed to have a maxima on an open set or with a discontinuous function. And we'll find out that if you have a continuous function on a compact set, um, you will have a maxima or a minimum or both. Um, so that's it. That is continuity. Um, and continuity ends up being a very important property. So continuity and limits, um, probably the two most important things to take out of this chapter four from the textbook and this particular part of the video lecture. We'll talk about this much more when we start doing calculus. At this point, you've now gone through the entire building blocks, parts one and two of the class. Congratulations. Um, what to do next depends on your interests. Going straight through would take you to part two on calculus. This is what you should do if you're interested primarily um, in game theory. If you haven't had calculus background before, um, it's a good thing to do now. If you're interested primarily in probability, you can safely jump ahead now to part three of the class. You would not be, under, uh, be able to understand some of the stuff on continuous probability distributions. So that video lecture might be difficult, but you can go ahead and take and, and work through um, the, the video lectures on discrete distributions and the more basic probability video lecture. As I said before, you could already have gone through and looked at part four of the class, linear algebra, after finishing the first video lecture. So now you can jump ahead to either of those two things. You cannot go ahead to part five without first doing part two. Um, so that's about it. I hope you enjoyed this video lecture, and I'll see you again, hopefully, in another part. Thank you very much.